Good morning. Welcome to Canyon Creek Church at our Everett Muckleteo campus. Uh, my name is Christian Limbeck. I'm the campus pastor at this site. Glad to have you here this morning. I also like to welcome the people who join us online. If you're at this service, you're a part of our global audience. Uh, people watch these messages in the service from all over the world, often in over uh, 30 or 40 countries during the week. So you're a part of something bigger than you and a part of the exciting spread of the gospel that's going around the world. Um, as you join us this morning, uh, especially if you have only been here a few times, you're joining us in a series called Ignite that we've actually been in for more than a year. Uh, we started this Ignite series and worked through the first half of Acts, then we took a break, a planned break from Acts, and now we've come back to it. And I told you two weeks ago that Acts 15 is this pivot point in the middle of this book. Uh, everything up through Acts to Acts 15 is really about Peter and the church in Jerusalem, and then the beginning of God's call of Paul in chapter 9, getting him ready. The great Jerusalem council, which decides, hey, let's make sure the gospel goes into all the world, which is probably a good decision since Jesus told him to do that. And then uh, from Acts 15 on, you see... Uh, the church unfold or ignite, that's the name of the series, that a fire that ignites in Jerusalem and bursts into a world fire burns out of Jerusalem all across the region, territory, Asia Minor, making its way to Rome and from Rome uh, to everywhere in the world. And that's why we've called the series Ignite. It's about that fire that God has started in every Christian that burns from them, it burns for them to share the gospel and it burns out into their community. It brings a good, a holy fire everywhere that it goes. And uh, it's been an interesting journey for us to come back to it. Now, let me say something about the book of Acts really quick. We often get caught up in studying the people, especially Paul, as we study the book of Acts. But it should be noted that the book of Acts is a story about what Jesus does. That this is not the end of his story. In fact, he says, I will send the Holy Spirit who will give you power. And he, through you, will become my witnesses to the ends of the earth. The true hero remains Jesus. The power by which it, done, it gets done remains the Holy Spirit. What you get to see is the account of ordinary people who God used. And I'd like to say more than ordinary, extraordinarily broken people whom God uses to spread the gospel all around the world. God goes out of his way to take the least likely candidate, diminish him even further by breaking them, and then use them as an obvious tool of his work so that no man can boast. No woman can say, I can do this. God can say, see what I'm doing. See the acts of Jesus Christ played out, and then you get to see it go through these people. But let's be honest, too, that Paul's a pretty extraordinary cat. Uh, that, I mean, this, this guy really went through the journey of obeying Christ, and I love that through him we get to see what one human being can do. What, what can one person do? Now, I don't want to turn Disney on you. Not all of you are going to do something extraordinary. Some of you are going to live extraordinarily ordinary lives. God wants to be with you in the faithfulness of your ordinary day that the raising of your children makes angels sing, that the management of your household is worship in heaven. You don't have to become Paul to be faithful. But I do want to show you that one faithful Christian can wreck the world. And I love that through Paul, we get to see an ordinary, and like I said, extraordinarily broken human being who will obey God, change the world with him. We have said throughout this entire series that the gospel, when it is delivered by a person who is ignited by the Holy Spirit, is unstoppable. God's plans will come to fruition. People break. Our, our strategies break. Organizations break. The gospel is unstoppable because God will always find somebody who will obey and be with him, fill them with the Holy Spirit, and equip them to do the work that they need to do. And he makes his gospel unstoppable. And here in the book of Acts, we get to see how he makes it unstoppable through the Apostle Paul, through Timothy and Silas and John Mark and all these available faithful missionaries. But it must be underscored again that Paul was just a man. He was not a superman. He was not a glorified 
Christian. He didn't come equipped with emotional and spiritual and physical capacities that you don't have. Uh, he got exhausted. He got depressed. He got distracted. He got disoriented. He got uh, spiritually attacked. He had the same physical, emotional, and spiritual limitations that you and I do. And what happens is we often categorize these people that we read about as though they lived in some magical self-space where and they were always felt the total equipping power of God and never had to go through deep internal trial or strife. Uh, if you think that about Paul, you have not read his words where he says, the more I unpack who I am, the more I figure out I'm the worst of sinners and that God was most gracious with me. Right? The more he finds about who God is, the less he becomes the greater God becomes, the more the gospel is amplified. He's just an ordinary guy who understood that he was bankrupt. Now let me help you with the key to your ministry. It begins not in your strength, but in your bankruptcy. If it begins in your strength, it ends in your strength. It begins in your bankruptcy, it ends in his strength. Trust me, he can do way more. Ignited by the Holy Spirit, the gospel is unstoppable. Ignited by you, I can stop it tomorrow. So it takes bankruptcy. He understood, I had no life. You gave me new life. He understood the outstanding grace he had received. He had the outpouring and infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is his critical power. You're going to hear him say in this morning's passage, it only happened because I came to you with the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. It was God in me. He was broken, filled up with the Holy Spirit, and then he obeyed. And he understood the importance of God's mission. I, I love it. In fact, if you don't catch anything else this morning, pray that God would give you Paul's heart for the lost. That you would have this something well up inside of you that when you see those who don't know Christ, instead of feeling obligated to sell them something you don't think they want, share the good news with them. That there's a God who knows them and loves them and made them and is recovering them and let that well up inside of you. That was Paul's burden. And so we see that God unpacked an amazing story in his faithfulness. Uh, this morning, we're three chapters from chapter 15, the big battle in Jerusalem. I told you about the Jerusalem Council. And Paul is in the midst of terribly difficult circumstances. Do you think that when Paul received the call to share the gospel, he thought, surely now God will be with me. There's the end of my trouble. Do you know that when God called Paul, he gave the words to a prophet named Agabus, said, now go tell Paul this. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. There's your encouraging calling, kids. Uh, there it is. I hear people all the time, oh, I want the intimate call of God. I want to walk close with him. I want to be his missionary, his anointed missionary. Okay, eyes wide open, friends. You want the intimate blessing, the power, the fellowship? You know what that comes along? The fellowship of his suffering and his reputation, right? That's what comes along with that. You get both. You get a share in his suffering. That's why Paul says, I count it pure joy that I get a share in his suffering. I count everything else as rubbish. There's nothing as good as walking with him. But with him comes suffering. And you see Paul in the midst of very difficult circumstances. Let me say this too. As you begin to personalize this morning's message, and that's the idea, that you read the word and you unpack what it means for you and you think, I see Paul went through difficult circumstances. I'm in difficult circumstances. What can I learn? First you can learn, Paul's probably going through something harder than you are. I don't know your story, but unless it has recently involved attempted murder and a gang hauling you with murderous intent, you're doing okay. And if Paul, this is for me, because sometimes when I, when like, you know how when men get sick, it's tragic, you just hand them a black rose so they can fall over and die? Sometimes when things are problematic too, I find myself like, I can't make it through this God, and then I kind of stand back and laugh at myself like, you see that the problem is small, right? <laughs> and so... Paul survived some real meat grinders. And you're supposed to look at them and go, if that man can be faithful there, and God could be good, and I am here, I bet you I can be faithful and God can be good. And if he's not a super Christian, just an ordinary man, I bet you God can teach me to unpack faithfulness in these teeny tiny steps so that he can trust me with more and more and more and more and more until I can handle more hardship and count it as pure joy along with James and Peter and Paul. 
So this morning, uh, do me a favor, open your Bible to uh, Acts chapter 18. Those of you online, you can do the same thing. And we will pick up Paul's story as he leaves Athens and he makes his way into Corinth. Our lead pastor, Brandon Beals, last week preached about Paul's time in Athens. Acts 18 begins with this very simple phrase, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. But what it doesn't, there it is, right? Uh, what it doesn't say is all the other information about how Paul is feeling about this transition. I've told you before that Acts is like a backbone running through the New Testament, and that if you go out and read the letters, you will find information that tells you about Acts and the context. And if you read Acts, it informs the people that he's talking to in these letters. And you can constantly find these kinds of conversations. And if we go out into Corinth, that's the, uh, the letter to Corinthians that Paul writes from Ephesus back to this church. In those letters, he often unpacks how he was feeling about this situation, what we learn uh, in other places. And I'll read you a few is that Paul is leaving Athens feeling relatively defeated. Um, in Athens, he had never intended to stay in Athens very long. In fact, he was passing through Athens on his way to Corinth. When he was in Athens, he was distressed by the number of their foreign gods. So he preached a message, and he found that most people didn't want to hear it. A few were saved, and that's the power of the gospel. Do you remember that Brandon said last week, it's your job to just preach the gospel it's not your job to create the results. And even in the worst circumstances, God will still create results. But what he found in Athens is he found people mostly who thought they were too good or too smart for the gospel. You know, see, this isn't the Athens of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. That was 400 years beforehand. This is old Athens. Athens is a little tired now. It's a university town. It's full of old curmudgeonly intellectuals. And the way they respond to Paul is by thinking they are too good for it. So he leaves feeling like, man, that I'm going to, I'm, sometimes I'm just going to declare the good news and some people are going to have too much of themselves in the way to hear it. And that hurts. So he's leaving Athens, the intellectual center of the new Roman Empire, and he's moving to Corinth. And as he moves to Corinth, he knows he's moving to a much more difficult city. From an old university town, he's moving to the actual new, true, financial political center of the Roman Empire, particularly in Asia. Rome is still growing, but Corinth is where the money is at. And where the money is at is where the politicians are at. And uh, Corinth is a relatively new city. It's got all the political power, all the new money. And new money is different than old money. When people get money for the first time, those are the people spending money like they're stupid, right? And so it's got new money, new people, new politics, a wild diversity. He's coming from Athens where they called him a babbler or a bird brain. He's feeling defeated. He's on his way to Corinth where he knows that he is going to run into money, diversity, and profound sexual immorality. Acts 17.4 tells us that he's going alone. He left his companions, Paul and Silas and Timothy. He left them in Berea. Uh, and then uh, uh, Luke is still up in Macedonia, so he's going into um, Corinth by himself, into this difficult city alone. He has no resources. He's under the pressure of a bivocational pastor, not only to declare the gospel, but to find a way to buy groceries, which is important. And so he's headed into the city just trying to imagine, how do I present the gospel how am I going to go and declare what the good news is to this group of wealthy, prideful, playful, sexually obsessed socialites who value a diversity over ideas over any singular truth? I am stricken how often Corinth sounds like Seattle to me. And I think Paul, uh, Brandon said the same thing last week there. They are doing whatever they want sexually. They have all the money that they want. They have the politics, the power, the diversity, and they don't want to hear about any one singular idea. I'll unpack that more in a moment. So Paul is leaving Athens. He's feeling beat up. His eloquence did not help in Athens, and he's on his way into Corinth in the midst of a difficult situation. In fact, he writes in his first letter back to Corinth, in the second chapter, verse 1, says this. And so it was with me. And he's writing back to the people in Corinth. And he's reminding of them when he came the first time. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, that when I came to you, I didn't come with eloquence or human wisdom. Now, this is important. He just got his butt handed to him in Athens. 
So he's like, let's get back to the basics. Watch this. I didn't come to you with human elegance or uh, eloquence or human wisdom, but just the testimony about God. For I resolved then that when I got to Corinth, I would know nothing with you. I was going to stay away from empty philosophy and know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness. Hear this. This is Paul. And in great fear and trembling. This word trembling here, you could also unpack. It's fine. And trembling, it uh, means I was so stressed out that I couldn't stop my hands from shaking. You with me? Like so stressed that I couldn't stop my body from shaking. And yet I still came. My message and my preaching were not wise or with persuasive words, but, and I said about who he was, but with the demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power so that your faith not, may not rest on human wisdom, but will ultimately rest on God's power because it's the message ignited by the Holy Spirit, which is unstoppable. So he says, I came to you broken. I didn't come to you uh, confident. I didn't come to you off a win. I didn't come to you thinking, man, you know what I'm ready to do? Take on Corinth. That, that's how we treat it. I, now I'm ready to go do He came, I am beat down. And now you're sending me to the hardest city that I can imagine. How could it be that I could go to Corinth? You see, I think our problem is we put these people in like a little historical biblical box. Like I said, oh, well, you know, I, it just, it was different then. Uh, like Paul wasn't, let's stop and think, what was Paul going through? He's alone, he's beat down, he is tired, he's short on resources, and now God has said, go declare the gospel to these people. He must be thinking, how do I crack through these people? They have everything they want, they do whatever they want. You want me to preach that there's an all-holy God who is condemning them for their sin, calling them to repentance, saving them by one God, which they will rebuke, whose name was Jesus Christ, who died, which they will hate, which is who is resurrected, which they will not believe, and that that's how they'll get saved. He must, his brain must be spinning. Imagine if I picked you up right now in however you're dressed with whatever knowledge you have, and I dropped you in the middle of Fremont, and I said, free these people. Go, what would you say to them? Right? What if I put you at South Lake Union as Amazon was getting off work? They're tired, they're irritated, and they're loaded. What do you have to say? Dear rich Amazon man, with everything you think you have, I got good news for you. Your good news better be that you can get me through the Mercer mess, because that's all I want to hear, right? How do you crack in? So Paul's thinking, how do I crack the door into these people? And I think we often think, oh, our context is hard. How would I possibly share with those people? Our context is not hard. Our context is challenging, but at least there are fairly normal people. Let me go back to Corinth for a moment. You see, Corinth had been a beautiful city that was destroyed. It was destroyed about uh, 145-ish, 146 B.C. A Roman consul, check out this name, Lucius Mumius. Boom, right? You like that? Lucius Maximus Mumius, right? And so uh, he went and destroyed Lumus Mumius, this city. I think you love that. Lucius Mumius, uh, because it was a growing threat to Rome. Like I said, Julius Caesar, seeing its prime location, it's on this isthmus between uh, Asia and down to Athens, seeing uh, what a perfect place it was located between two seas, this by Maris location. Uh, Julius Caesar rebuilt it as a grand city, and he filled it full of money. You see, because that way you could take a boat. You didn't have to go all the way around Athens, which was dangerous. Uh, all the way around Greece, but you could just cut through Corinth, save yourself time and money. They'd actually drag boats if they were small enough across this isthmus, or just unload them and load them on another one on the other side. And so all the goods of the world, all the ideas of the world, all the money of the world was flowing into the city of Corinth. It's interesting that when they needed a population for Corinth, what they did is uh, Julius Caesar gave Corinth to all of the freed Roman slaves. If you're a Roman slave, you could work off your obligation, become a freedman, and often they were anxious to de develop a self-sufficient life. He sent them all to Corinth, and so this wildly diverse slaves from all over the corners of the earth 
who wanted to make some money and make their way in the world all came to Corinth with new money, new opportunity, new streets, new everything. And so it is the wild west of Asia. It is people do whatever they want, they have whatever they want, and there is no singular idea they value except for I do whatever I want and money. That's it. In fact, the only thing that they're really known for is for being sexually licentious. Now, two weeks ago when I described this, I may have said too much. And some kids may have had to ask their parents some uncomfortable questions. And I may have received some email, maybe. So I will... <clears throat> uh, but it's just, this is a very difficult city. There's a, the Acro Corinth, above Corinth, there's this high plateau, and on it is the Temple of Aphrodite. And from the Temple of Aphrodite, every night, more than a thousand prostitutes would flow out into the city, and they would sell their trade, kids, uh, and they called it worship. So that the mindset that a Corinthian had was God is a God that needs my food and my money and some time uh, and the way I worship is this way and that's the only ideas that count that's where he has to declare the gospel so perhaps you were thinking Microsoft was hard Microsoft is not hard Boeing is not hard the financial resources of Mukilteo do not erect a barrier we cannot cross to declare the gospel because if God can go to Corinth, he can go anywhere. I love that God, that by the obedience of Paul and the power of the Holy Spirit, God plants a massive church in the heart of Corinth. And he uses their resources and their diversity and their connection to spread the gospel all around the world because the gospel when it's delivered by somebody ignited by the Holy Spirit, is unstoppable. Not even Corinth can stop in it. And if Corinth can't stop it, you can stop sweating wherever you are at. I love that for all this to come about, Paul had to stay. He couldn't give up. He couldn't run away. He couldn't let his discouragement stand in the way. He had to stay in the game. He had to stay at Corinth. He had to obey God. And I think we can pull three very quick principles this morning uh, from how God works who is God? Because you're not Paul. Don't ever make theology like, I'm Paul. I'm going to do exactly what Paul did. But are there principles that you can pull out of it? Who is God? How does, how does he work? How does life work? And how can I walk faithfully by observing what Paul did with them? Let's go back to chapter 18, see if I can pull three of these uh, out of there for you. I said he went to Corinth alone. But you're going to see he's not alone for very long. In fact, when he gets there, he meets another Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. Now, this is kind of interesting because Pontus is on the southern shore of Turkey. So this is this very mobile, diverse city, right, who had recently come from Italy. So he moved from Turkey to Rome, met his wife in Rome, and moved from Rome to Corinth. That's exactly the kind of city this is. Uh, and because Claudius had ordered all the Jews, and we can read about that in extra biblical text, to leave Rome, Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker, that's why he went to see them, as they were, he stayed, and he worked with them. Every Sabbath, so he worked during the week, but on the Sabbath, he'd reason in the synagogue, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timothy finally, I would love it if said, came back from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively then, didn't have to work anymore, to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So many good things in this passage. Let me just see if I can pull a couple of them out. I want you to notice that when the going got tough for Paul, God sent in reinforcements. God reminded him that he was not alone. There were other Christians with him, and he quickly meets Aquila and Priscilla, who become dear, dear friends with him. I can prove it. Priscilla's her nickname. There's no uh, Italian nickname, Priscilla. Prisca is the name. Priscilla is a nickname. That's an affectionate name, right? This is somebody that you no, so he greets Aquila and Priscilla. They get sent off into their own ministry. They change the world for Christ. He calls them later co-laborers with him, and he met them through these very normal, faithful circumstances. He came to the city alone, and he needed a job, right? So I told you it's a very diverse city, and anytime you have a lot of diversity, people tend to collect together with the people they know. You've seen that like in high school, right? <laughs> so... Uh, they collect together, and you'd get these guilds, like a union. You'll see that next week in Ephesus as well. But Paul is a tent maker. He has a job that he knows how to do, a trade that he's good at. 
So he goes to the guild of tent makers, and when he does it, he meets Aquila and Priscilla. A zillion principles in here, but let me start with one. If Paul had thought he was too good to work, A, he wouldn't have eaten. B, he would have never met Aquila and Priscilla. What if Paul had thought, you know what, I'm kind of an apostle now. That's sort of a big deal. Maybe I don't need to work anymore. Timothy, you should work and send me money, right? Uh, if he had been too good to do his job, he would have missed the blessing of these two precious souls. Because he was willing to do what it took to spread the gospel, God immediately put people in his life. Interesting little side note for you. Are you ready for this? Anybody who's training to be a rabbi, you chose this for a child. If you were training your child to be a rabbi, you had to teach them a trade so that they could make money. No one was raised just to be a rabbi. You had to know a job. In fact, there was an old saying that said, if you are training your son to be a rabbi and you do not train him to have a job, you are training him to be a thief, right? This is probably a good little life rule for everybody, including pastors. Uh, be, have some way. Now, Paul's going to later say, pastors, you're worth your pay. You're worth double the honor, as uh, Bill said today. And you're going to see in a moment, he gets pay. But in the moment, he never let pay keep him from declaring the good news. He never said, well, I'm going to take this job or I can take that job, but ministry only pays $20,000, so I'm out, and I'm not going to declare the good news. It was irrelevant to his income. He had just decided, I was going to declare the good news. And if I have to work six days a week and declare the good news on the Sabbath, so be it. I will do it that way. But look what happens. Not long after, uh, Timothy and Silas do arrive. And they've brought, we learn from another passage in 2 Corinthians 11, 9-ish, 10-ish, that um, they've come back with a gift from Macedonia that they intend to supply his needs. So it says right after that, after that, he gives his full-time attention to preaching. So you see both. He works, and when he's free to preach the gospel all the time, that is exactly what he will do. And I just love, I just want to drill this home for you, for the, if you are in the midst of difficult times, again, maybe not this difficult, but wherever you are at, and you're in the midst of trouble, tech, typically, when we get in trouble, we get insular. We do this. Oh, oh, it's so bad. Oh, woe is me. It's all down, right? We pull in and we don't look up. And God is constantly trying to lift up your head and say, hey, look, you're surrounded by people who love you and know you. And if you won't see them or meet them or talk to them or interact with them, you're just going to get crushed all by yourself. Don't get crushed all by yourself. I built you for community. You're surrounded. If you're in a church now, you're surrounded by people who care about you. Even if I don't know you, I am united to you. I care about how you're doing. That's how the church is supposed to work. So when you get in trouble and you stay at home and just fall to pieces like this, lift up your head and notice the good people that God has put in your life. When the going gets tough, notice the good people. Be grateful for the good people that God puts in your life. There's a flip side, interesting corollary. Sometimes you're supposed to be the good people. How about that? We're not always just supposed to encourage you. Sometimes you're supposed to encourage other people. You with me? So that when they show up here broken, you encourage them. You're the encourager. Tens, turns out you can't do that from home. I've had people say to me occasionally, oh, man, when the video plays, I feel like I should have just stayed at home. I can do that at home. You know what you can't do at home? Encourage the people around you. We are a community built for community. He had to go to his guild to get the encouragement. And then his guild came to him and gave him encouragement. When the going gets tough, lift up your head and be grateful for the people God puts in your life. Number two, here's another quick one. When the going gets tough, I think remember you're never alone. And I don't mean this in the same way I just meant that one. Because God is with you. Let's, let's read this next verse. This is great. Picking it up in uh, verse 6. It says, But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive to him, he had to shake out his clothes in protest and say, your blood be on your own heads. I'm clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will only go to the Gentiles. So then Paul left the synagogue, went next door to the house of uh, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler in his entire household, believed in the Lord. Love that. Going to come back to that. And many Corinthians who heard, believed, and were baptized out of this house church. 
And one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. He said, Paul, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack or harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed on a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Again, I just so many good things in here. In the midst, remember, he's feeling down. So he goes to his people, people, the Jews, and he declares the good news to them and they turn him away. This would be like going to your most intimate connection. You go to your family and they tell you to take a hike. Paul says in Romans 9, I love the Jews so much that I would give up my own salvation. 9-3, Romans 9-3, I'd give up my own salvation if only they would get saved. That's how much I love them. They're my heart and soul to see them saved. So when he is rebuked by the Jews, he is heartbroken. That shaking out the coat is literally, I shake the dust of you off of me. We are no longer connected. I have nothing to do with you. And he didn't do that with a hard heart. He did it with a heartbroken heart. These were his people who he loved in the midst of this incredible difficulty, turned away by those closest to him. God whispers in his ear. He says, Paul, I am with you. You are never alone. I am with you. Do you know that he actually says, I myself am with you? Now, you might be thinking, thank you for that useless information. But what he says here is the I am is with you. He uses a Greek term. It's ego and me, which some of you have heard me talk about before. It means the I am. Uh, and me already means I am. So if you put ego in front of it, which is I, you're just saying I am. And it's the equivalent of his Hebrew name, Yahweh. When he was asked for his personal name, he says, tell them I am the I am, Yahweh. I have been, I will be, I am right now. It's actually a participial form, I aming right now as well. I am the I am. The I am is with you. He doesn't just say I am with you. He says the I am is with you. The great I am is with you. I am personally with you. When he tells Joshua, who's moving into Canaan, who is going to face just painful situation, he says, Joshua, do not be afraid. Be fearless, courageous, and bold, for the I am is with you. When Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and then runs away afraid for his life, feeling defeated and exhausted and tired, you know, when you, on your greatest win, can be a defeat if you don't stay with God, right? They flip-flop. I'll get to that in a second. So he runs away. He is just beat down before God. And while he's feeling totally defeated in that moment, God comes to him and says, Elijah, don't be afraid. The I am is with you. You are not alone. I am with you. The I am is here. I am with you, he says. And also, don't freak out. There are 7,000 other people who have not yet bowed their knee to Baal. So you're not, don't freak out. He turns around and says the same thing to Paul here, right? He says, Paul, don't be afraid. I am is with you. I am with you. And don't freak out. You're not alone quite yet. For I have many people in this city. Lift up and be grateful for the people around you. And never be down, Casper. Who is with you? I am. I have the power that I am is the all-powerful, sovereign God of all things who was and is and is to come, who loves you and knows you and is with you. In fact, don't you think the greatest comfort of the Christian life might be the I am is with you? Because he never says, I'm making it easier for you. I know we preach this stuff all the time, but he says, become a Christian. I will challenge everything you think you know. I will turn your world upside down. I will choose the stupid stuff you used to choose as a joy. I will crush it and take it away from you and give you better things. You better know I am with you. Because if you got religion during that, you're in trouble. If you have the I am, that is how that is the ignition of the Holy Spirit that makes the gospel unstoppable in your life. I am is there. You are never alone. Finally, the last little one I love in here says, when the going gets tough, remember that your worst situation may yield your greatest win if you remain faithful. I just said it's the flip side, too. Sometimes your greatest win can be your greatest failure because you're weak after your greatest win, and you tend to act like a ding-dong after that. But sometimes your greatest failure, God can yield your greatest win if you remain faithful. Here's its dark corollary. 
if you do not remain faithful, you will never know. If you only complain in the midst of the test, you will never know if he could have proven faithful. Hello? If you just fold, if you give up, you always lose. If you try and fail, that's life. When you quit, it's just done. He had to stay in to see that God could unpack his faithfulness. Let me go to verse 12. It says, Why Galileo was the proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. And they said, This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our law. I just don't even know how to say how short-sighted that is.